Hi, everybody. I'd love to introduce Michael Zingali from Stony Brook University, who's been simulating the making the hydrodynamics of stars and their explosions. Yeah. Welcome, Michael. Great. Thank you. Um, indeed. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our algorithmic work on modeling stellar explosions, talk about some of the challenges. What, what my group focuses on a lot is developing algorithms that can efficiently model what's happening in the interior of stars um, that run on large supercomputers. So I'll talk about some of the challenges um, that we face. Uh, first, just to give a background, I know we're a diverse audience, just to say a little bit about what stars are. I mean, we all know our sun, right? Our sun is usually thought of as a pretty average star. It's sort of midlife. Right now, it's generating its energy by fusing hydrogen into helium. It'll do that for about 9, 10 billion years total. After it exhausts its supply of hydrogen, it, its structure will adjust and it'll start to burn helium into carbon. And then, you know, uh, it would like to go further up there, but that's about as hot as our, our sun will be able to get. So stars, they generate their energy via nuclear fusion. When you fuse light elements into heavy elements, you release uh, energy, the binding energy of the nuclei. And you can do that until you get up to iron. Uh, once you get up to iron and nickel, that sort of group, that's where the plateau of nuclear binding energy is with, with uh, mass number. And it's no longer, uh, you no longer get energy out if you try to fuse elements together. So that's gonna prevent, uh, present a barrier to stellar evolutions. The other bit we need to know is that fusion's very temperature sensitive. Helium burning goes like temperature to the 40th power. Increase the temperature a little bit, the amount of energy you get out increases tremendously. And the more massive a star is, the higher temperatures they can achieve. And that's simply because uh, what's happening inside of a star is its structure is basically pressure pushing out against gravity. And to generate high pressures, if you have a massive star, it needs to be higher temperature in general. Um, the higher the temperature, the, um, the easier it is to overcome the Coulomb repulsion between two nuclei, bring them close enough together such that the strong force can, uh, can capture them and generate fusion. So, we want our stars to get hot and massive stars get hotter and that's going to drive fusion and we're going to try to understand how that works um our sun has evolved since it was born four and a half billion years ago it's gotten about 20 percent more luminous and the reason's simple as the as we burn hydrogen into helium the composition in the interior is changing and the pressure support depends on the composition loosely speaking when you, um, everything's ionized inside of a star. So when you have hydrogen and you have four hydrogen go into one helium four, you have eight free particles initially, four protons, four electrons. And when you make fuse those into helium four, you have three, three, three free particles now, a helium nucleus, two electrons. So you've lost the support from uh, just the number of particles. So since you have fewer particles, each of those particles has to push harder. Uh, and so the thermodynamic structure of the star has to change. Um, so these changes can be abrupt when stars exhaust their fuel supply and they, um, they need to adjust dramatically in order to achieve the higher temperatures necessary to burn the next heavier fuel. So we're going to talk a bit about this. Um, there's some other fun bits. Uh, our sun will end its life as a white dwarf. So it'll never get hot enough to burn beyond carbon. It'll basically be a big ball of carbon and oxygen, about 60% or so of its present mass, about the size of the Earth. And it'll just sort of cool. Uh, very high mass stars, stars that are like 10 solar masses or more, they'll get hot enough so that they can burn hydrogen into helium, into carbon, into uh, oxygen, neon, silicon, and generate an iron core, and then not be able to get any energy out of that iron core, and the core will undergo a collapse, and that'll lead to a, a supernova explosion, what we call a core collapse supernova. Um, stars also tend to have 
companions. Most stars are in binary systems. And if the stars are close enough to one another, those stars can interact with one another. And you can revive a white dwarf, like we'll be left behind with our sun, uh, if you transfer mass from its companion onto it. And that can lead to another class of explosions. And I'll talk about, um, I'll talk about one each of these types of explosions and talk about some of the challenges involved in modeling this. Um, all right, so we want to model these. We write down uh, equations from physics that basically are conservation laws. They tell us about conservation of mass, momentum, and energy, and they include all the physics that we need. We treat a star as a fluid. Basically, we're saying that um, we're working on some scale that's small compared to the overall star, but large compared to the random atomic motions that we can sort of average those out and talk about the bulk properties of the star. This is a fluid approximation works really well in, in astrophysics. Um, in addition to hydrodynamics, which is basically conservation of mass, momentum, and energy as a continuum, uh, we have to have reactions. We have nuclear reactions. And uh, the math of those is very similar to how you treat chemical reactions, but it adds um, uh, a source term to the energy, and it also changes the thermodynamics. We need self-gravity. The star itself is held together by the fact that it's massive and every particle is attracting every other particle. Uh, we probably need radiation and diffusion. Those are um, efficient means to transport energy inside of stars. And we probably need magnetic fields. And depending on what we're working on, we might need general relativity or things like that. So a whole laundry list of the pieces of physics that we need to model. Uh, and then we have to change these equations into something that the computer can solve. Most of stellar evolution, so if you open up an Astronomy 101 book and you read about what's going to happen to our sun, uh, and they'll talk about from the birth to, to its death, uh, what's, what, um, how long each phase is going to take, most of that knowledge is done by modeling stars in one dimension, treating them as spherically symmetric, in one dimension, you can you can solve you can evolve for billions of years. It's challenging still, uh, but you also need to understand you have to make a lot of approximations. Stars are in binary systems; you can't model a binary in one D. Stars are rotating. You, how do you deal with that in one D? So there's approximations. Convection is an important transport of energy. Convection means that you have hot, buoyant material that's rising up, and cooler material that's falling. And given this overturned motion. You can't model that in 1D, so we use uh, we use a prescription for that in 1D. And so we want to understand um, what happens if you do a full multidimensional model, 3D models of these stellar explosions. Uh, what does that tell us that we can't capture in 1D? Um, so this is how we go about solving our equations. Our conservation laws can be written like that equation I have up there in the in the top. Uh, this is a canonical form of uh, a hyperbolic system of partial differential equations. U here is uh, our vector of conserved quantities, mass, momentum, and energy density. F is the flux of those quantities. And S represents local source terms. And what this says, uh, oh, hang on. And, and in order to solve this, what we're going to do is we're going to represent our star on a grid, like I have shown there in that picture. And uh, in each one of those cells in that grid, we're going to store the average state of the star, average mass, momentum, and energy, any other quantities that we want to go along for the ride. What that equation says is that in that blue square, if I want to say how does the mass in that blue cell change in time, that conservation law says that the only way the mass in that cell can change is by mass flowing in through the boundaries. Um, and that's really all that says. And so all of our computational complexity in our codes is trying to figure out what the flux is of mass, momentum, and energy through each of the faces that represent these cells. There's so a question. Yeah. Uh, how fast does causality travel inside of a star? Is it like a speed of light phenomenon, or is it so is it so opaque that it just travels slowly, like a war of a material thing? I, I missed the first word you said. How fast does what travel? Causality. 
Yeah, I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. Awesome. Yep. Yep. Um, One other sorry. question. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned the boundaries of the individual computational cells, but I can yep. see in your picture also the boundary between the star itself and not the star. Is there an explicit yep. boundary in these methods? No, no, no. Just the we, picture. we basically just go down to a density that's like, we typically do like 10 to the minus five grams per cubic centimeter. There's nothing there. And, you know, it, we don't have to worry about it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, right. So there is a source term there too. Um, so for things like energy, that would also uh, that would also say that energy can change by there being some local deposition of energy within that cell, for instance, due to nuclear reactions. So this is what a conservation law looks like. We parallelize the computation by breaking the, this grid up into larger chunks and putting each of these chunks on a different node in a supercomputer. Uh, typically, uh, you know, a moderate sized simulation now might use... 1024 zones in each direction, so a billion zones, 1024 cubed. Um, we use a technique called adaptive mesh refinement, which basically uses a hierarchy of grids to allow us to focus resolution on the parts that are interesting in our flow. But uh, but I won't really dwell on that. But the main uh, main idea is that we can um, we can spread the computation across massively parallel supercomputers. So to answer your question, uh, Greg, um, in the equations of hydrodynamics, there's three speeds at, with, at which information propagates. It's the fluid velocity and the fluid velocity plus or minus the speed of sound. So if you were to drop, you know, uh, throw a rock into a pond and those ripples propagate outwards, th these are the speeds that, that you're seeing now. Um, the speed of sound in stars is much greater in general than the speed of sound in air. It can be, you know, like um, a tenth the speed of light or something like that. Because stars can be incredibly dense. But it's the sound speed that we need to worry about. And in fact, that sound speed um, imposes on us a restriction on how fast we can advance the evolution of our star. So we have an initial state of our star. We come up with some initial conditions, put them down on the grid, represent uh, represent that star in each of those cells. And then we take a small time step, advance it in time based on that conservation law, compute the fluxes through every cell face, evolve it one little step in time, and then we just keep on repeating the process. The time step is restricted such that no information can move more than one cell per step. So we can't have a sound wave cross more than one zone per second. And you know, that's mathematically that's needed for stability, but you know, that's a reasonable thing to deal with anyway. I spent a lot of time working on methods that can get around this by filtering out sound waves if you're very subsonic. I won't talk about those, but you know, there's lots of fun things you can do. The thing that I am gonna focus on is uh, what happens when you don't just have hydrodynamics, but you have other physics like reactions that are equally demanding, that may present their own uh, time step restraints in them. So I'm gonna rewrite that system now like this. This is my um, uh, time evolution of some conserved state, which think of mass, momentum, and energy. This is advection. So think of this as you know all the sum of all the changes through the, the faces of those cells. And this is what reactions are doing. Reactions present a source term to how the state evolves. Um, in astrophysics and chemical combustion as well, uh, the reaction source can be very stiff. There can be a wide range of timescales that are important, and you need to respect those timescales. Usually what that means is that you want to use an integration method that's implicit rather than explicit. For hydrodynamics, that would be very expensive. And so we have a different character in how we want to tra uh, treat these two source terms. One of the ways that uh, our community has traditionally done this is use a technique that's called operator split. Well, I'll show that in just a second. I'm gonna introduce the codes first. Um, uh, and a problem, and the problem that we've been trying to counter in, in the last few years in our group, is that if you're not careful, Reactions can try to push the evolution in one direction and, 
advection, hydrodynamics wants to push it in another direction. And the two processes could decouple. And you'll get something that's not physical. And so I'm going to talk about the work we've been doing on algorithms that help strongly couple everything together. Uh, we work on uh, a suite of codes that are called the AMRX Astro Suite. AMRX is a library based at Lawrence Berkeley Lab that does adaptive mesh refinement for the exascale. Uh, our group contributes to AMRX. We work on some codes. They're all up on GitHub. Everything that I show you here is going to be up on GitHub. We, you know, we do all our development live there, even um, as we're we're um, working on new problems. So uh, you can check that out. I'm going to focus on this code Castro, which is our compressible astrophysics code. And, um, and I'll talk a bit about some of the different types of stellar explosions that we model. Um, we work on another code. And you know one of the fun things about stars is that uh, they bring in all sorts of subdomains of physics together thermodynamics, nuclear reactions, gravity, general relativity, all that stuff, electromagnetism for magnetic fields, all those things come in together. Uh, and we need to you know, be fluent in what is happening in each of these uh, domains. And in particular, when we're modeling stellar reactions, we need to keep pace with what is happening in the nuclear physics community. The nuclear experimentalists are measuring reaction rates or building big detectors to try to go after exotic nuclear masses and, and such. We um, we created a library called PyNuc Astro, uh, which is an interface to the data that nuclear experimentalists measure and our simulation codes. And so what it does is it provides a nice Python interface to the nuclear reaction data, allows you to interactively explore what the rates are. Say, I care about these nuclei, find all the rates that link them together. And it'll output the um, uh, the reaction network looks like a system of ordinary differential equations. So it'll output the uh, right hand side that tells you how each of those nuclei evolve in time based on the rates. And in Python or in C plus plus, it'll write the code out. And uh, um, so this has become very useful because it allows us to automatically generate these networks as uh, as needed and tailor them to our specific problems and also keep pace with what's happening in the nuclear community. Um, one more one more sort of picture. This is this is uh, one of the machines we run on Frontier. It's at Oak Ridge Leadership uh, Computer com, Computing Facility. Uh, it's, a, it's a big machine, 9,400 nodes, each of which has uh, a multi-core CPU, which we basically ignore, and four effectively eight GPUs, uh, AMD GPUs. And our task is to use as much of this as we can to spread our star across all these nodes. And since most of the performance on modern supercomputers is on GPUs, basically offload all the computation onto the GPUs. So I'll talk, uh, oh, I guess I'll talk briefly about that right now. Um, we started working on, uh, making use of GPUs about six years ago or so. Originally, our code was written in a mix of C++ and Fortran. If you look at what the, uh, the hardware vendors provide, the libraries they provide, they heavily favor C++ over Fortran. Most software um, stacks seem to have that, that bias. So over time, what we did is we moved everything to C++. It actually wasn't that bad. You can see. Uh, our Fortran usage drop and our C++, we ported everything piece by piece um, dis discontinuously at the end of 2000 till we're basically uh, a fully C++ 17 code now. Um, that allows us, that together with work that uh, some of my former students had done uh, and the work at, that people have done at Berkeley, allows us to take advantage of a very simple method to offload our computation onto GPUs. So basically, um, we write a kernel that looks like a, a C++ Lambda function that in AMRX, it basically uh, handles the offloading onto a CPU or a GPU and divides the work on a GPU one cell per 
uh, GPU compute core and then brings everything back. Uh, we basically move everything to the GPU at the start of our simulation. We allocate a pool of memory there, do everything on the GPU, only move stuff back as needed, like to write stuff out to disk. But otherwise, uh, we find that we get good performance on there. And as an example, here's on Frontier. This is a problem I'm not going to show, but this is burning on the surface of a neutron star. Going from 48 nodes to, uh, what is this? 256, 512, uh, no, that's 512. To 512, we scale pretty well. This is fixed problem size. So we start to lose work as we increase by more than an order of magnitude the number of GPUs we're running on. 512 nodes is um, uh, 4,000 GPUs. And you can see we start to flatten out a bit, but it's not horrible. There's just simply not enough work. We'd run a bigger problem if we wanted to use this many uh, GPUs. So we scale pretty well. Uh, when we've done this conversion, we've written our code with a GPU focus. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much more about that. I'm gonna talk about the algorithms. Is that a question? Or... Yeah. Sorry, do you mind questions while you're presenting? I don't mean to interrupt. Okay. okay. Um, I had two questions about the GPUs. The yep. first was, um, do you find you can use the single precision capabilities or is double precision required for these simulations? I'm very conservative. So we use double precision. Okay, uh, makes number, sense. Numbers in astronomy are big and small differences matter. Uh, it's one of the things that I want to explore more is to you know see what parts of it we can get away with in single precision. Um, and in particular, and I'm sure machine learning will come up as a question as well, and I have the same sort of conservative approach there as well. In particular, there's parts of our algorithm where we need an initial guess, and then we refine that guess. And those are places where, you know, using reduced precision or using a machine learning model to provide those initial guesses and then refine it uh, could give us a big acceleration. And so that's something I'd like to explore. Got it. That makes sense. Thank you. And then my second question, sort of related, is on the GPUs, uh, how does this combine with the adaptive mesh refinements? Is there challenges in breaking this up across, you know, normally if you have a homogeneous grid at the same resolution, it's very easy. But I imagine it's more complicated than that with AMR. Is that right? It, it is a little more complicated. Um, it works best in 3D when you have big grids because then there's a lot of work to spread around. So basically, if you can keep the GPU fed, it works well. Uh, the way that AMRX uh, handles the the offloading is um, when when you divide the the domain up into small patches that represent your adaptive mesh hierarchy. Those patches basically define a region in space. They have you know a, a box, and the the lambda offload basically says, "Here's the box I want you to run on. Here's the kernel. Spread the work across," and that's what it does for us. And so as long as that box is big enough and the kernel has enough to do, then it seems to work quite well. In fact, it works surprisingly well. Uh, um, it works better with CUDA than it does with HIP for us right now. But you know maybe that's simply because NVIDIA has had more of a head start. But, um, but it does, it works well. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, so what I said previously is that one of the challenges here is modeling things, uh, modeling multi-physics. When you have hydrodynamics and reactions, that's what I'll focus on, but you can also have gravity, you can have diffusion, radiation, all this other stuff. How do you solve a multi-physics system when each of those different components might have its own characteristic time scale that it cares about? The approach that's usually used in our field and in, in many fields is something called operator splitting which basically says you treat each process independently. So for reactions, reactive flow, uh, a common way to do operator splitting is to start with some state at time n, evolve for half of a time step just based on what reactions are doing. Then take the state that has seen half a time step of burn, do the advection, do the hydrodynamics for a full time step, take that state and do the last half of the reaction. By uh, making the reactive update symmetric like this, you can show that this is second order accurate in time. But 
when I'm burning here, the reactions don't know that there's a flow. So they don't know that, you know, there might be PDV work that is changing um, the thermodynamic state that the um, that should be going into those reaction networks. And remember, those rates are very temperature sensitive. Um, as a result, if you're modeling explosive flows, the you can have a decoupling. The reaction and the hydro can get out of sync. And a common way to fix that is to cut your time step below that sound crossing time of a zone to something that's closer to what the reactions want to see. This makes it a lot more expensive. But, you know, if you take the time step down to zero, everything's coupled perfectly. You're just going to do a lot of work. Um, we've, we've been developing some other methods. Um, our applied math people showed us this idea that's uh, called spectral deferred corrections, which is a, a more formal way of treating the update in an iterative fashion that can generalize to high order. And we did things uh, at relatively high order there. And then we sort of blended that together with, with what we have been doing all along to create this method that we call simplified SDC, simplified spectral deferred corrections. And what we do here is uh, we first compute what advection will do over a time step with a guess of what reactions are doing. And we basically just use what they did last time step. And then we solve this system that is an ODE system, uh, change in the state with time uh, due to reactions, but explicitly include what advection is doing over the time step as a piecewise constant in time term. Because, uh, because this advective term didn't actually see what reactions are doing this time step, we do it a second time. We recompute, recompute the advective uh, part and then solve this again. And so, and then this is a single update where the reactions are seeing what advection is doing. It looks like I'm doing everything twice and I kind of am. But when I do it this way, um, because the reactions are seeing what the advection is doing, I'm actually staying closer to the true solution. And I remove some of the stiffness from the reaction integration. And the reactions are actually have an easier time. And so even though on paper I'm doing twice as much work, computationally this can be faster because the reactive solve becomes simple. Um, I was and say is the time step shorter as a result? Oh, uh, long term. All right, all right. And so, so then the other bit is that I don't have to reduce the time step down to the reactive time step. I can advance things on the hydrodynamics time step. There's one more thing I was going to say, but I don't remember what it was. Uh, here's what it looks like visually. This is basically a plot where every time I call the right-hand side and in integrating that reaction network, I print out the state over two time steps. So this is one time step. This is a second time step. This is shown the, the uh, fraction of the mass that is helium. And this is what you do when you, what you see when you do operator splitting. The reactions uh, evolve the, um, the amount of helium without really knowing there's any advection going on for half a time step. And then advection creates this jump in the amount of helium. And reactions work really, really hard. You can see the density of points here is very close together to bring us back to the solution at the end of the time step. And then next time step, same sort of thing. And here's our uh, strongly coupled, this simplified STC approach. We basically smoothly go right between the, the solution. And there's fewer points overall, showing that the reaction network had to be evaluated less times to get us an accurate solution. Um, all right, so our interest then is with these new algorithms. So most of the community does operator splitting, and some actually do a rather poor approximation to it. Um, with this better method that better handles multiphysics, can we evolve stars more efficiently? Can we get around the problem where sometimes you have to cut the time step? And so I'll show two examples. And um, the first is um, a model of type 1a supernova. These are thermonuclear supernova. We don't really know what these things are. Um, we see explosions. There's about one per second in, in our universe, about one per century in our galaxy. 
the universe is a big place. Uh, and we we know that these involve the explosion, thermonuclear explosion of a carbon oxygen white dwarf that's in a binary system. But we don't exactly know what the whole model looks like. These things are very dim and they're very rare, uh, very dim before the explosion and very rare um, in our galaxy. So it's hard to see what the explosion looks like beforehand. When they do explode though, they shine with the light output of like 10 billion suns. And so they rival the brightness of the host galaxy. So here's a galaxy uh, and here's a supernova. And this wasn't there a month before and it'll stay bright for a month or so and then it'll start to fade. And it's insanely bright. These things are so bright, you can see them across the observational universe. And these have been used as distance indicators that helped us understand that uh, the expansion of our universe is accelerating. We know based on where they occur and based on just, you know, order of magnitude estimates that these are an old stellar population it involves a white dwarf. And if you blow up a white dwarf, convert the carbon and oxygen into uh, iron and nickel, you produce enough energy to blow apart the star. That nickel is radioactive. It's decay powers the light curve and it can generate something that's as bright as what we see. But we don't exactly know, is it two white dwarfs that interact and merge? Is it one white dwarf that gains mass from its companion and grows to the point that it explodes? That, that detail isn't clear. So um, we're modeling something that's called a double detonation. This is one of the models for a type 1a supernova, a thermonuclear supernova. And the idea is that you have a low mass white dwarf, something like the mass of our sun or eight tenths the mass of our sun like that, that has a binary companion. And that binary companion transfers mass to, to the, the white dwarf, um, and it builds up a helium layer on the surface. That binary companion can be a helium white dwarf, can be an evolved uh, uh, star that hasn't yet become a white dwarf that's mostly helium, or it can dump hydrogen that steadily burns to helium on the surface. You build up a layer of helium that's about um, uh, a few hundredths of a solar mass. At the base of that helium layer, you reach densities of a million grams per cubic centimeter. You reach temperatures of 100 million Kelvin or so. You get to the point where you can start to burn helium into carbon. This is a reaction called the triple alpha reaction, very temperature sensitive. And you can uh, trigger a detonation in that helium. And that detonation will race around the star, propagating across the surface of the star through the the helium um and at the same time it'll send a compression wave in towards the center of the star and that compression wave will converge somewhere near the center compress the carbon of that underlying white dwarf to the point where it ignites for carbon to burn you need temperatures closer to a billion kelvin uh to drive a detonation and then that will um burn from the inside out and blow up the whole star if you look at what's done in the literature, a lot of people wind up having to cut the time step. Detonations are hard to model. These are supersonic burning fronts that require a delicate balance between the hydrodynamics and the reactions. And so this is a case where lots of people cut the time step. And we want to see how our method works. This is an example of a reaction network we use. Helium burns, where's my cursor? Helium burns to carbon. Uh, and you can keep capturing helium nuclei, get up to nickel. You can also do things like capture protons and then um, uh, release a gamma and get back to this. This line here is equal numbers of protons and neutrons. And you can see there's like 28 nuclei in here. With our uh, Python library, this is the code needed to generate that. Say, these are the nuclei I want. This reads in 80,000 nuclear reaction rates from a community library. This says, find all the links. Here's some other rates I want to approximate and write out the code. This writes out the C++ code for us. Here's what so the question. Oh. Uh, what the dimensionality of this interactive space? You said it's driven by temperature, presumably pressure, but maybe magnetism. And I can imagine a bunch of other stuff that may affect these reaction rates. Um, yeah, so reaction rates are strongly temperature sensitive. They depend on density to a much lower power. Um, and they depend on composition. So, I mean, pressure, 
pressure is redundant if you have density temperature and composition. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Yep. So here's an example. Uh, ignite a hot spot in, uh, in, at the North Pole. A detonation races around the white dwarf in about a tenth of a second. Um, this is showing temperature. This is showing composition. More purple is like iron and nickel. This is showing the reaction rate. Red is exothermic. And this is showing the compression. I'm going to replay this in a second. So on the left, you see burning front. This is a high uh, helium detonation. It launches a compression wave. And you can see this compression wave is propagating towards the center. And when it converges on the center, you get hot enough that you ignite a, um, a detonation there. And this then propagates from the inside out. And effectively blows apart this star. This is done in 2D in an axisymmetric geometry. There's not anything here that really would require 3D. Uh, and so it's much cheaper. And our, our interest here was in understanding what the um, uh, how well our integrator worked. And so here's what we can see. Um, there's a bunch of curves here. The gray curves, which you can't see because they're the this orange line's right on top of them are our new integration method um, where we took a big time step. There are two different time steps, just differ by a factor of two, both smaller than the time it takes for a sound wave to process up. The, the blue lines are if you use operator splitting. And even if we cut the time step a lot or make the tolerances really, really tight, it takes a lot of work for us to converge to what our new algorithm does. And this is how many node hours these calculations took. That's what we care about. We want our results fast. And what we see is that the case where we did operator splitting that matches our new integration method, which is this orange case, which matches our new integration method, which is this gray line here, takes three to four times more compute time because we have to cut the time step a lot and make the reactions do more work. And so it's more expensive for us to do it the old way. Uh, or likewise, for the same amount of computational work, we get a much more accurate answer with our new method. So the new method's more efficient. Uh, we're running now the case where we actually model the binary in 3D, at model the mass transfer from the companion onto the surface of the white dwarf. Here's an example of the detonation that's then ignite it in that helium. And we're this is just starting, but we're trying to understand, again, how sensitive our results are to how we do the integration. It turns out there's two different groups that have done this, and they got two different answers. And we want to see where we fall. I know I'm running low on time. I'm going to skip this. Um, my one other example is uh, what happens inside of a massive star. Uh, in my very quick intro to, to stellar physics at the start, I said that stars generate their energy by fusing light elements to heavy elements. And more massive stars can reach higher temperatures, which allow them to fuse heavier elements. This is a 15 solar mass star. After it exhausts all the hydrogen in its core, it'll begin to burn uh, helium in its core. When it exhausts that, it'll burn carbon and then neon and oxygen and silicon until it gets to an iron core. When you have an iron core, there's no, you don't get energy out by fusing it. And so that iron core is inert. And it's basically trying to support the mass of all the star above it. But it can't do it by generating um, energy via fusion to get high temperatures to give a, a gas pressure that supports it. And so it becomes degenerate. Quantum mechanical pressure kicks in, and uh, it's the electrons that are doing most of the support. But the electrons can only support so much. They can only support about 1.4 times the mass of our sun in the iron core before it will collapse. Uh, this is something called the Chandrasekhar mass. Chandrasekhar discovered this in the 1920s. It's the limit to how much uh, quantum mechanics can push up against gravity, classical gravity. Uh, this is what the model looks like. This is a log scale. Uh, this star is much bigger than our sun, like um, 
a thousand times larger in radius, 15 solar masses. The inner about 10 to the eight centimeters. Astronomers use CGS units. All our numbers are big, so who knows why, but this is like inner uh, 3000 kilometers is iron. Outside of that, there's a silicon shell where you're burning silicon to iron. That's raining iron ash onto the core. Outside of that is oxygen. That's burning oxygen plus oxygen into silicon, growing the silicon shell. Again, that gives more, uh, produces more iron. Carbon shell, uh, helium burning shell. And then the part that's off screen would be the, the hydrogen envelope. Um, it's very hot in the center. A few billion Kelvin, like four or five billion Kelvin. When you're that hot, the forward reaction rates that want to go light elements up to heavy elements get balanced by reverse rates, which is basically saying that a photon, when you're four billion degrees, has a typical energy of a few million electron volts, which just so happens to be the energy, typical energy that holds a nucleon to the other nucleons inside of a nucleus. That means that if a photon hits a nucleus, it can break it apart, something that we call photo disintegration. And so you have a balance of building up heavy nuclei and the photons that are generated just because you're hot, uh, breaking apart the nuclei. This leads to something we call nuclear statistical equilibrium, which basically says that just as a function of density, temperature, and the relative excess of neutrons to protons, I could tell you what the composition is going to be if you're in this equilibrium. So we modified our method to allow us to capture that nuclear statistical equilibrium in the core, evolve a real reaction rate uh, outside of that, and seamlessly blend together um, if, a, if a part of the star wants to enter this equilibrium or not. Most of the work in the literature cut out this iron core they don't model it either they so yeah this is definitely new to me so i'm finding this a bit surprising so are you saying that there's an iron core that's so hot the incoming photons can break up the iron into well protons and neutrons which yep. well, first and, and so it, it kind of it sounds like a, and sounds like another energy source because does that make it hotter or what are those nuclei well, go? it's exothermic though uh, it, uh it's endothermic excuse me it's taking energy out uh, uh -huh. And there's an additional issue here. Uh, so these aren't really incoming photons. These are the photons that are just black body photons, just because it's hot, right? Uh, but there's an additional trick here. Um, those free electrons can also capture into the nuclei, and a process we call electron capture, and turn a proton into a neutron, make more neutron-rich nuclei. So they can change the relative fraction of neutrons and protons in the core. When they do this, that's a reaction that involves a weak nuclear force. It emits a neutrino. That neutrino can leave the star and carry energy away. And so those neutrino losses also start to contribute to the cooling of this core. So this breaking down of the nuclei and these neutrino loss losses start to uh, take energy out of the core, which causes trouble for the star. It, it, it starts to lead to the, what will be the collapse of this core under the weight of gravity that drives what we normally think of as a supernova, what we call a core collapse. It, 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 you, the iron core is starting to accumulate a neutron core and neutrinos flying out. Yeah. And so there's yeah. a proton core as well in there somewhere too. Okay. Now, eventually it'll become, uh, once it collapses from like, uh, it's a few thousand kilometers of collapse down to about 10 kilometers or so. That's the, that's the density at which neutrons, when they're degenerate and the strong force can provide support against gravity. You'll reach densities of like 10 to the 15 grams per cubic centimeter. You'll be opaque to neutrinos at that point. The neutrinos will be trapped and they'll be an important part of the subsequent explosion. But right now at these densities, the neutrinos can freely stream out. And so they start to take energy out. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. If you look at what's done in the in the field, a lot of groups cut out the core. So they either do spherical geometry where they have the center cut out, or they just don't evolve the core. We want it to self-consistently evolve the core. 
And also groups um, wind up cutting the time step dramatically uh, below what hydrodynamics wants to do. We found with our new algorithm, we don't have to cut the time step. We can evolve on the natural hydrodynamics time scale because we strongly couple what's happening to the reactions uh, and hydrodynamics. And we can evolve uh, what's happening inside of the core. As a result of those electron captures and changing the, the neutronization of the core, we can capture that and capture how this equilibrium state wants to evolve leading up to the core collapse. Um, so here's, here's a quick snapshot. I'll show you the movie in a second. Uh, this is going to be really zoomed in. This is about 1% uh, of the domain. Um, this is in 2D again because, again, we are interested in the just the geometry. I'm running some 3D stuff, but I don't have... Uh, uh, we are interested in the time integration. I'm running 3D, but I don't have those plots in here. Um, this is going to show the convection, the iron core, the silicon uh, burning shell around it, the base of the oxygen core showing the convection. The energy is coming out so fast that it has to be transported by convective flows. And you're sort of going to see the roles of the convection go here. You're also going to see when I start the uh, animation, you're going to see it looks like it stutters a lot. And the reason for that is that we started with a model that was generated with a 1D stellar evolution code that was um, about 500 seconds before collapse. In 1D, you don't have a realistic velocity field that can tell you how convection is going to carry away the energy. So we can't um, initially prescribe the velocity field that will be necessary to keep this star in thermal equilibrium. So what we do is we run for a bit, let the reaction start to drive convection. And then we reset the thermodynamics to the initial model, but keep that velocity there. And we do this a bunch of times until we build up a realization of what velocity would be needed to carry that energy. And then we let it run. So that stuttering you're going to see at the beginning is us trying to establish that initial velocity. Um, this is, oh, i got to remember, this is Mach number. This is vorticity, curl velocity field. This is composition. This is energy generation. And you're seeing here iron core, um, the silicon burning shell surrounding it, oxygen burning shell surrounding that. You're seeing the convection is becoming very vigorous. In fact, this is something that's kind of a flaw in 2D. In 2D, you tend to build up really, really large structures that can generate large vortices. In 3D, this wouldn't happen. So, you know, you take this kind of with a grain of salt. But um, what we were able to show is that if you look at, for instance, uh, you can look at a bunch of things. This is looking at temperature. Um, by the way, it's always good to do, to do the following. If I run this model without any reactions, it shouldn't evolve in temperature. And that's, that's what this is. It's a little noisy uh, because there still is some neutrino um, evolution was there neutri I, no, there wasn't any neutrino evolution. Um, it's still a little noisy because there still is convection just because the temperature gradients are steep enough to, to, draw, to drive convection. But there's no strong evolution in temperature. It, it's amazing how many times people don't do this test to make sure nothing really happens when it shouldn't. Uh, and it's a simple test to run. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. This is a different case where some physics that wasn't properly modeled in the 1D case was included. Um, but these are a bunch of runs where we change how we do the initialization. We change how big the time step is. We change um, how uh, how big the domain is. And we play around with all these factors. And we see that we uh, get pretty much the same evolution. Uh, we're able to evolve this. And we seem to get uh, a reasonably converged solution, even if we advance the state of the star on this larger time scale. Um, I know I'm running out of time. I have I could show more models of this, uh, more problems as well. But the the basic uh, summary is going to be that, you know, when you're doing multi physics flows, sometimes you have to revisit some of the assumptions that have been around for a long time in the community, and work on algorithms that, uh, even though they look like they may be more work, 
the strongly coupled uh, stuff on paper looks like it would be more work actually winds up being more computationally efficient. Um, just a few little uh, side projects. Uh, I have a Python code I started 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, uh, that uh, codes up a lot of these methods. It's so old that it actually was written with numeric originally. Then I had to port it to NumArray, and then I had to port it to NumPy. Uh, I'm hopeful that NumPy is going to stick around now, and we're not going to change again. But you know, it's gone gone through a lot. But I use this code to um, help teach students uh, how the methods work in our field. I have what's basically a, um, a um, open license textbook that derives how we do computational astrophysics up on GitHub. It's written in a way that people can do pull requests. <clears throat> Excuse me, do pull requests to make changes if they find mistakes and such like that. And there's some more community text up on there as well. Um, I work on, uh, I also run a seminar with, with some co-organizers called Vast Virtual Astronomy Software Talks, where um, we have two different software open source astronomy software projects present to the community what they've been doing. We've been doing this for two years or so. Um, and it's one of the sort of, you know, things that we learned, and I guess you all learned as well, um, with, with COVID is that virtual talks provide a nice way to get, uh, to get an audience together to see some of the cool stuff that's doing in the field with rather low overhead. Um, so those are my advertisements. Um, here's my summary. Um, we're interested in developing new algorithms that allow us to model uh, stellar explosions more accurately and uh, more efficiently. And going, um, taking a look at how we treat multi-physics was, was our, um, the main thrust here. And coming up with methods that more strongly couple the hydrodynamics and reactions has paid off and allowed us to do simulations more efficiently of a whole bunch of different types of stellar explosions. I showed two examples here. Um, the the other main point is that all the work we do is open. Go to GitHub. You can see our codes. You can see the problem setup scripts to make all the plots that I showed there of, of all the work that we do. And I'll stop there. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Are there calls on the uh, questions in the call? So one thing. Oh, Matthew. Oh, no, no, no. Um, yeah. So what one thing I was wondering about, so the, your trick of um, going from 2D to 3D and yeah. you have to kind of boot up the bossy field, uh, that rhymes to like other, I mean, uh, uh, AGB simulations have the same problem. When you have something very fine grained, it starts in a state that's not real. So they yeah. run for a while to stabilize it. Yeah. And I'm curious, is there, um, a property of the underlying equations that makes this actually work because I can imagine this diverging horribly in the right situation. I mean, like it's in the wrong situation. So, what what makes your situation compatible with this kind of bootstrapping? Um, I I can answer it a couple different ways. One, I would say that's the nice thing about being an astrophysicist and not a mathematician, is that I don't have to worry about you know uniqueness and those sort of things. You just try it out and see what happens, and it seems to work. So that's one answer. Um, I don't, I don't think there's anything that guarantees that it should work, right? But you have, so first of all, you, you have to have your, an assumption that the 1D model is doing something reasonable, right? And so the 1D model is approximating what convective energy transport would look like, because it can't see those overturning motions. But what the, can what that approximation in that 1D model basically tells you is it tells you what the temperature gradient should be in the star. When you have a temperature gradient that we put in multi-dimensions that has basically high entropy beneath low entropy, that is unstable to convection. So it's going to start convecting on its own. That's just a multi-dimensional fluid instability. So, um, you know, so in some case, we know that's going to happen. 
What we want to prevent is the following. Because the reactions are so temperature sensitive, if we just initialize our domain with, uh, with a, the state of the star that's still, the reactions can run away in place before there's a convective velocity field that can carry that energy away. And that will lead us astray off of what we expect the solution to be. So we want to have something in there initially to stir the star up to prevent that runaway happening. That's going to be a transient that we want to get away. This is a method that we came up with. Now, I, I am also, you know, worried that, you know, does this work? And so we explore it the best way we can. We run without it. We run with it for, you know, uh, 50 seconds, 100 seconds and, and more of stirring up the star to see if we get the same behavior with it. And we seem to be pretty robust to how much of that initial um, initialization we do. So that's the best answer I can offer is that the code seems okay with it. And physically, you know, it makes sense that there should be such flow on there. Is it the only way to do this? Most likely not, but it seems well behaved. All right, that makes sense. And the other thing I was wondering about is just the whole concept of multi physics, because mm -hmm. in some ways it's all physics, it's all you know, yep. one back with uh, universal equations. Yep. But for historical reasons and code modularity reasons, they are different operators. So, to what extent is this an artifact of how we write it? And to what extent are there really like the operators move in notably different ways that? create these numerical instabilities and coupling yeah. things independent of how we organize the code? Uh, it, it's a little of both. It most certainly is a case of how we write. Traditionally, you know, there's people in Astro who have just worked on nuclear synthesis. So they'd write reaction networks on their own and just, you know, see what happens when you burn to a certain process. When people have been started building these big codes, the people who wrote the hydro got together with the people who wrote these nuclear reaction networks and glued them together, right? And so there is that historical bit that uh, that led to the operators. Uh, but there also is a mathematical reason why um, why we still may do it, and that is that uh, the hydrodynamics we use explicit time integration. New state depends on the old state. Um, the the reaction networks are stiff. And when you have a stiff system, in general, you want to apply implicit methods to it. And so you want to integrate the reactions implicitly in time, but the hydro explicitly in time. That means, you know, somewhere you're going to be doing integration in two different ways. And so that decouples it. Um, and so that also can be naturally done with operator space. What our method does is it predicts what the explicit uh, hydro term is and then uses that in the explicit reaction update. And so that, you know, ultimately it's the implicit integration that, um, that updates the entire state for us. Um, I should say that there are, there are other approaches to do the reaction integration explicitly that work in some of our cases. Uh, and there are people who work on fully implicit multidimensional hydro. It's a hard problem. But uh, in general, it's it's both of those, as you said. It's historical, and it's just sort of the, the mathematical character of the the different physics that, that leads to this split. It's so that's one thing a lot that, easier to maintain. Yeah. Oh, that is, in fact, a very good reason. Yeah. But now... It's going to be the ML question, but really, I mean, yeah. if somebody were to toss at you new approximations, yeah, very flexible approximations, not flow to uh, not to the 64 bit, but like various interesting approximation methods, even like uh, adaptive multigrid is a, a shot at uh, approximation. Yeah. How do you evaluate whether it fails, the conditions under which it fails, uh, so you can bound its use appropriately? So what's the evaluation? Because I'm hearing a lot of the same flavor in your non-ML work as you would happen in ML. I think you're right. 
um, you know, I'm modeling what's happening in the inside of a star that we can't observe, right? And so at some point, you have to appeal to your sense of physics to ask, is what I'm seeing physically plausible? Because a lot of what I showed isn't directly observable. You can connect the dots and get to something that's observable later on. And that's what you would, uh, that's what ultimately would be your validation that what you're doing is correct. Um, so if you were to give me some ML model for something, I'd plug it in and I'd see how big of a difference I get. And then I'd ask, am I okay with that difference or not? So for instance, we tried to replace the entire reaction update with a machine learning model. We trained a neural net on uh, on the right hand side, and you know we could kind of get something that looked okay for us, but I think that was a bit too much. But the place where I might be more amenable to doing machine learning, which is what I already mentioned, is in all those places where I need an initial guess, which can be time consuming, especially for this STC stuff. Uh, you know, I do iterations. So maybe in those initial iterations, I could do something much more proximate and then have the later iteration be more exact. And maybe that'll be enough. And maybe that'll accelerate stuff. So that's yeah, sort of... Like, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, so that's how you do implicit. Implicit is mostly some kind of iteration yep. until they convert. Right? Yep, yep, yeah. So in those initial stages, that's where, that's where I'm interested in exploring ML. Yeah, maybe it's a lot of sense. Well, yeah, thank you very much. This was fascinating. Yeah, well, thank you.